Have you ever wondered how the modern computer processor is made? Yeah, same. So imagine my excitement when Intel invited me, several other influencers, and a whole mess of traditional tech media out to Malaysia to visit and film their most important global factory. Now imagine my disappointment when I arrived in Malaysia, was told I actually wouldn't get to go inside because they only had space for the journalists, and that I should just make a vlog or something about the whining and dining Intel did for all the invitees. After essentially saying, nicely, but after essentially saying, screw that, and sitting through two days of boring slideshows, I was frustrated that I took a whole week off of work for what amounted to one sponsored Instagram reel. But I started to make peace with the fact that maybe I had just chosen the wrong career path and should have instead become an actor for commercials about men with male pattern baldness or something, I don't know. Alas, it seems this newfound peace was only visible from inside my heart and not whilst looking at my very agitated face. Because when the entire entourage of influencers was paraded to the factory doors to take pictures of the building, but then subsequently dismissed to go back to the hotel so that the real tech media could go inside, our collectively Botoxed influencer faces appeared so sad and defeated that A.K. Chong, the Intel executive in charge of the factory, said, said, to heck with the rules, I'm the boss and I'm letting you guys come inside. AK, you're the best. You literally made my week. The factory was amazing, but I wasn't allowed to take my camera inside. And I was frankly still so pissed at everyone that worked at Intel, save for the one spectacular VP who dared rage against the machine, that I didn't want to make a video just to spite them. But you know when something is so cool and so special you can't stop thinking about it? Yeah, that's how I feel about my time at the Intel factory that's now over two months in the past. I can't not share. So I asked all my BFFs over at Intel to scrounge up whatever footage exists from the inside. And I'm happy to report that I have enough to tell you how Intel goes from the lab to finished product. And it's mind blowing, so buckle up. It all starts in Kulim at a factory an hour outside of World Heritage Site, Georgetown. This facility, System Integration and Manufacturing Services, or SIMS, is basically the factory for all of Intel's other factories. Something completely obvious in hindsight, but something I never really considered is that in order to prototype, test, validate, and package brand new chips, they need to invent and manufacture much of the equipment to prototype, test, validate, and package these brand new chips. Some of this work is outsourced to third-party companies, but far less than Intel's competitors, because A, no other major chip maker in the world designs, fabs, and packages their own chips in-house, and B, having vertical integration like this allows Intel to both maintain secrecy, but also rapidly iterate on-site. They make everything here, from the blades inserted into modular testing units for use early in development to weed out flaws in the silicon design, to system level testers that replicate tons of different consumer hardware combinations for evaluating compatibility and stability as manufacturing draws near. Then there's the actual testing cells used in Intel's factories to sort and bin the brand new chips as they come off the line. This manufacturing prowess extends beyond incredibly thick, multi-dozen layer PCBs. They even make the metal hardware jigs and rigs used to hold these testing boards. And while assembly appears to be on somewhat of a line, Sims is not filled with assembly line workers. This place is jammed to the brim with highly experienced engineers needed to not just manufacture, but also design the hardware required. Sims Malaysia is the only factory of its kind in the world, and it is from here that they ship stuff to every other Intel factory and facility on the planet, including a place back in Georgetown, across the second longest bridge in Southeast Asia. And that is the Design and Development Lab, codenamed PG-16. Look, I would be lying to you if I said I knew what any of these B-roll shots really entailed. Heck, I had a tenuous grasp on the facility's objectives as a whole because they are so hyper-secretive about it and it's so convoluted. But I do remember this much. Pre-production chips come here to be tortured, essentially. There's this one test where they load the chips into a socket and use liquid heating, yeah, to push the chip way past its T-junction temperature to see if it survives as long as Intel thinks it should. Other tests include overvolting the chips, stressing them to insane lengths, plugging in every combination of I.O., including broken hardware, and more. But not everything at PG-16 is destructive. Teams here are also mostly responsible for working with Intel's partners, like motherboard manufacturers, uh, enterprise clients, etc., to ensure that partner products will play nicely with Intel's upcoming silicon. 
And perhaps not so coincidentally, it's also often here that official clock speed and voltage ratings for new chips is determined, because a chip's real-world capabilities can finally be contrasted here against the targets that were originally set out by the silicon designers. Pretty cool. Now, PG-16 works alongside an even smaller facility next door, an understated lab that looks frankly like something you might find at a California high school or a junior college. But it is one of pinnacle importance to Intel, and that is this, the Failure Analysis Lab. Chips that fail validation are sent here to determine why the fault occurred and what corrections need to be made in chip design or manufacturing to prevent it from recurring. An error they demoed for us was this one. Two systems running alongside each other. The bottom is working properly, and the top, as you can see, is displaying tons of visual artifacts on screen. This failed chip would eventually undergo loads of testing to locate and explain the error. But how do you do that? Well, the method might be as crude as probing individual pads on the chip, or as advanced as submerging the CPU and using ultrasonic frequencies to scan the die layer by layer. Then using an ion beam to mill down the chip at an atomic level until the failure is revealed. It was nuts in here. I did a lot of smiling and nodding, pretending like I understood really anything at all. Yes. Oh, cool. Ion beams? Sure. I mean, who would have thought that mass producing a brand new CPU is the easiest part of the process to understand? Not me, but it totally is. It's still pretty wild though. It starts with sand. Okay, Malaysia doesn't have a fab, so I didn't get to see the wafer creation, lithography, and Foveros 3D packaging, but Linus has an excellent video about this process on his channel. Watch that after this video, or pause and come back. And we brought in this segue to our sponsor. Thank you, Linus. So. We head back to Kulim to see one of Intel's four global packaging and testing facilities. And it all starts at die sort, die prep. It's all in the name. And if that doesn't make sense, well, we'll explain it. Unfortunately, this facility is so super secretive that Intel couldn't provide me any video. <clears throat> Don't worry, there's more video coming in a minute, but at least for now, I have pictures. It starts by taking the wafer and slapping it onto a mylar backed sled that sticks to the wafer itself. That sled with the wafer is loaded into a laser machine, which cuts the tiniest little channel in between the individual dies. But then they remove it from the laser machine and put it into a different machine where tubes pour water all over the wafer and a literal spinning cutting wheel, like a Dremel tool, <laughs> slices all the way through the wafers to cut them out into individual dies. Now it does this with enough precision to cut not just through the dies, but into the super thin mylar, just barely but not enough to go through the mylar because again, we all want them attached on the wafer. Pretty bananas that they have this level of precision. But I asked, isn't a laser more precise? Why not just use the laser for the whole process? Or, or why not use something like a water jet cutter if you're throwing water all over the dyes anyway? Well, the reason is chipping and heat damage. The other two, water jets and lasers, are just too aggressive and they generate too much thermal energy to the newly lithographed dyes. So the laser, creates just a shallow little channel that the diamond cutting wheel can slide along, that can follow without skating. It's the best combination, crude as it may seem, according to Intel. Now, those sleds with the dies fully separated kind of turn into like a little fabric. You can put your hand on the back of the mylar and all the little tiles are, you know, not really attached, but they're still glued to the mylar. So they're loaded into a machine where UV light reduces the mylar's adhesiveness. And then the individual fingernail sized dies, they're very, very, very tiny, are pulled away by a robotic arm at lightning speed, like crazy fast, and placed onto a tray. So it goes bing, boom, bing, boom, bing, boom, bing, boom, boom. That's the sound it makes, actually. Now these trays, with the chips perfectly organized, are then loaded into cassettes, where once full, not so little AGV robots arrive to pick up the entire cassette for testing. The robots then take them next door, where the cassettes are loaded into the sorting and testing machines that are clustered into groups about the size of a school bus. This facility is huge and has dozens upon dozens of groups. Now, each individual group has 40 testing cells, which are machines built at the Sims factory we discussed earlier. They are big. They're about five feet by five feet by two or three feet, weighing each over a thousand pounds. And there's 40 of them per cluster, and there's tons of clusters. In fact, these things are so heavy that they would break the subfloor when removed for servicing and upgrading. So Intel actually covers the floor in airtight plastic and uses hover carts to levitate and glide them across the facility when required. It was nuts. 
But what do these big, huge testing cells do? Because again, one of these, five feet by five feet by two feet, only tests one chip at a time. Well, they have thousands of tiny little probes that make contact with the die to check for defects and to measure and bin the chips based on their performance. Don't forget, this is all testing done on the bare die, allowing them to save big money not having to package and complete chips that will ultimately be broken or unusable. The tested dies, once completed, are placed back onto the tray by the individual cell, and then they're sent back in the order they arrive back into that same cassette that they, well, came on. So, you know, cassette, the tray goes into the cassette, the cassette goes into the machine, the cassette loads the tray into the cells, the cells test all the chips, then put the tray back into the cassette, the set then goes on to the robot once again and return to the yellow room where that same robot arm from earlier will separate the good dies from the bad ones. It places the passing ones, based upon their performance, into separate reels for shipping and, well, the bad ones, they just get disposed of. <laughs> Pretty cool. Now this whole facility runs almost entirely automated, 24-7, with just a few engineers on hand for when things go wrong. It is wild to see the whole entire place just like robots and beep boop bop boop boop and then no humans in sight. Okay, so that was the super secret stuff. No more pictures, we can get back to cutting edge video. Because those reels of completed dyes are sent across town back to the less super secret Penang, as well as other Intel processing factories around the world, to be turned into what we ultimately identify as a CPU. That begins with chip attach, where the dies are removed from the tape reels that they were placed on previously and put with micron precision onto a green PCB substrate. The placement is verified with advanced optical microscopes and then a machine lowers, vacuums both the die and the substrate so that they can be perfectly flat and then thermally compresses the thousands of solder beads on die with heat needed to flow the contacts to one another on each side of the board. So there you go, die, substrate, glued together. Now, not really though, because even though the die is now electrically connected, there's still microscopically small air gaps that need to be strengthened so that stress can be uniformly distributed across the die. If all that's holding it together is solder balls, you move that one little bit and it's gonna break. Not good. So epoxy reveals itself yet again as the solution to every problem being applied near the die and flowed underneath the die in between all of the individual solder balls using capillary action. Super cool. If you've ever seen a delitted CPU, you've almost certainly noticed this epoxy before, even subconsciously, because seeing the chip they showed without epoxy applied looks super bizarre. <laughs> Now, following the epoxy job, the PCBs are moved to the next machine that applies a bunch of thermal interface material to the die and then follows the perimeter with epoxy yet again. But this time, it's to apply the integrated heat spreader, familiar to anyone that's built a PC before. That, as the name suggests, spreads out the heat from the chip to a larger surface area before it makes contact with your CPU cooler. And, well, now the chip is complete. But it's really not, because Intel puts the completed chip through a bunch of tests to ensure proper validation. A burn-in process exposes the chip to high temperatures and voltages to weed out early defects. And then, electrical chips are performed to ensure all traces on the chip are functional. Last, Intel mimics customer and product usage conditions in what they call PPV. Basically, every chip is loaded into a device built at SIMS that tests hardware conditions, platforms, operating systems, and more to ensure that everything you might throw at it as a customer will pass with flying colors. And that's how a chip goes from start to finish. I had an amazing time at the Intel factory and continued to be blown away that one, this stuff is even possible, two, that it can be economically viable, and three, that Intel has the level of verticality to do it. As we've seen the last few years with Intel, that isn't always a plus, but they seem pretty hellbent based on new roadmaps they've released and new factories they're building, that they're not just going to remain competitive, but they might be competitive enough with TSMC to become an alternative fab for companies like AMD and Apple to utilize. If that happens, that's great, and I hope it pays off because competition is good. And it's clear to me, having visited there, that there are a lot of amazing people at Intel that are passionate about what they do. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, that other button works okay too. Thank you so much for watching, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.